I'd like to thank you for the opportunity to speak to you all about what is the number one issue for our country and our industry at the moment. And uh, please, questions at the end would be appreciated. I can't promise I've got the answers. There's a lot of people in government at the moment that don't quite have the answers as to where we'll be in 2019. But to understand your concerns as professionals as to what you're worried about when you hear the word Brexit, it'd be very helpful. So if I can reassure you or give you an answer, or if I can just take the question away with me to consider later on, all appreciated. Um, my name's Vernon Hunt. I've been in the, involved in representing the hospitality industry to government for just over four years now. But I've been working in and around government for over 10, in parliament, in different government departments. I'm a bit of a political geek, to be honest, and that's, that's why I have the job I have now. I think the point to make, and I think we all appreciate this, is that the time of political uncertainty has never been higher in our lifetimes. Um, when the British Hospitality Association Summit took place last year, three days after the referendum, we had William Hague, the former Foreign Secretary, former leader of the Conservative Party, who said it was the most difficult set of circumstances a government has inherited since 1940, which gives you a sense of the scale, the real strategic level um, scale of the challenges, I wouldn't say problems, because problems is a, is a word that has many connotations, but the challenges that we now, as an industry, uh, and as the UK, and as, a communi as communities, have to face when we look at life outside of the European Union, um, and what that means. Because the vote was taken, and I think mean, apart from a small minority at the moment, at least, uh, most people resigned that that vote was valid, and there was a clear majority of 52%, and that is the world we now live in. Um, now, the referendum result was simple in one, um, one extent, because it had a clear, decisive result. And you will have heard in the weeks and months following it, what does Brexit mean? And the Prime Minister has been one of those persons who's been a bit teased in the news for saying Brexit means Brexit, because it is a process, it is a negotiation. There is no ultimate uh, Oxford English Dictionary definition of what Brexit means for us as an industry for the next generation and beyond. Um, but it is definitely happening. And there's still a large degree of uncertainty. Um, I'm going to have some slides which will be going into some of the issues and what the BHA is campaigning for. And also I will be bringing us back to other important issues to the industry that were there before Brexit. And they're still there in terms of being competitive, in terms of investing in skills. There is there as much as ever. And I think one of the challenges for us as an industry and for all industries is that it's never been busier. Um, in, for the BHA at least, the amount of select committee submissions we've put in, these are representations to parliament, representations to government, discussions with ministers, discussions with MPs, it is going at, at quite a pace. And that's not just us, that's the system in government as well. So time is short. And we have to make sure every representation we do, every trade association representation of the government, the, the discussions you have with your local councillors, with your neighbours, and uh, with your MPs, they all matter and they all shape the debate. It's not just led from the front pages of different newspapers. Um, so, a recap. Uh, we're nine months after the referendum. Uh, there was a lot of speculation, Article 50, uh, which was the two-year deadline, would be activated by the Prime Minister this week which would set the, the ticking clock, or the, you know, the, the, the countdown uh, for, gov for our government and the European Union to agree the final settlement. In that time, uh, despite predictions, you may remember the previous administration, some forecasts of the Bank of England, it's been largely uh, positive, and that's something I've heard from uh, BHA members up and down the country, of course. You know, there are exceptions, but I, I would say the consensus is generally consumer com confidence is held up. And there hasn't been a, a catastrophe as some forecast before the referendum. If others have heard differently or experiencing it differently, please do let me know. Um, the uncertainty is going to continue. I've covered that. And the single market uh, and our relationship with the European EU single market is going to be the key issue. That's why we are where we are when it comes to Scotland. Because the Scottish government believes that the UK should have a very, very close, almost unchanged, as I understand it, relationship to the single market which is about tr facilitating trade with the least amount of barriers. Um, and the Westminster uh, model, which is looking for a much greater degree of autonomy from all the obligations the single market entail. So discussions around the single market will have a, 
have a big impact on, again, where, where, that, where that goes. The interesting, I think the interesting point to say there is that although the Parliament has voted in favour of Brexit, of course, most of those MPs were anti-Brexit before the referendum. So you've got a Parliament that's voted in favour of something that wasn't necessarily committed to before the people expressed their will, which is making for some very interesting debates. And uh, the big question when it comes to workforce... Um, I'm, going to be, I'm going to bring up a slide in a second, but there are a lot of EU citizens in the country uh, and it was never envisaged that the United Kingdom, in, envisaged in the sense of the processes that exist in the Home Office and across government, that there would need to be a process to work out their actual status with the UK outside the European Union. And when you consider it's around 3 million people, that is a lot of paperwork and the system isn't quite there yet in terms of making sure that these people have the certainty and the clarity in terms of their careers, their family life, you know, where they're going to be and what, what rights uh, uh, they'll have. I, I, I was having a conversation with someone earlier and um, I, I think we could expect this, and I've heard this from, the, from ministers, that it should be one of the first issues to be resolved once Article 50 has been activated. That's the speculation. It is only speculation, but it's informed speculation. And that means hopefully fairly on in the process EU citizens would have the certainty that you, you would want them to have in terms of you know being valued members of our teams um, so we wouldn't necessarily have to wait till 2019 which would be good in terms of Brexit campaigning Brexit in terms of its impact on us is all-consuming and it goes in all directions there are regulations built up over 40 years and they, they, they go into all parts of our economy but what are we talking about in the first, uh, well, in this, in, at the strategic level, at the, in this two-year priority. It's market access. It's making sure that we're not cutting off our markets that we depend on for custom, obviously. Uh, it's the reputation of the UK. Um, and this is something that I feel is really important that all of us, every single person who works in the hospitality industry has a duty to do, which is your, your, uh, uh, my chief executive calls all of you ambassadors for the country in terms of the welcome people receive and it goes beyond our industry as well it goes to border force and border security and, and other people but you can once you lose a reputation as a welcoming open and friendly country it's very hard to win it back and I think we as an industry do a huge amount in in preserving the reputation as the, of the UK as a welcoming destination and I think government's also quite aware of that they don't want to damage that reputation so I think in the negotiation to come where there's a narrative we need to ensure that it is substance it is focused and it is not hyperbolic. We need to make sure that discussions in the newspapers don't get out of hand, and we need to correct the record where we feel that it deviates too much and is actually damaging not only to our industry, uh, but you know, our reputation and indeed the, the whole of the United Kingdom. And realistic immigration reform. Now the word realistic is in there for a simple reason. Um, there is what is politically achievable. Whatever you feel the ideal immigration system is for hospitality in the UK, you know, we can't implement it unilaterally. Uh, it depends on a political consensus that holds at Westminster and that can be agreed by a majority of the House of Commons. And at the same time, you have people in different parts of the country who voted for Brexit, and there's a dispute as to how much of them did, but voted for Brexit with immigration in mind. So the government, we need to work with the government, we need to partner with the government to let them explain how, as an industry, immigration and skills and talent and these great people that come from the European Union are vital to our economic growth um, and vital indeed to the growth and, that, and jobs that are created for British people and for British residents. We need to make that case. We need to make that argument. And then we have to see what final settlement can help government reach its objectives without damaging our businesses. And that's going to be very complicated. Um, you'll be pleased to hear that the VHA has been working very hard on this. Uh, my colleague John Guthrie is the employment policy advisor for the VHA. And um, he has been working on uh, working with KPMG in terms of understanding in really full detail what, current, what the current dependency of our industry in particular is on EU workforce. That isn't ready yet. We're hoping to have that ready, I would say, soon. It's well time considering where the government is in its process. But all I will say is that when John did the initial estimates um, at uh, a few weeks after the referendum result, 
And they were, they were as informed as the essence could be, they were about commissioning a report like this. Um, we looked at the 4.5 million people that work in hospitality and tourism, based on Oxford Economics um, data. And the, the, the conservative small C estimate uh, was, and uh, we, this, this is a national average estimate, different sectors would be different, different regions, the UK would be different, but the small C conservative estimate was 15%. Um, and that's not including obviously workers from other parts of the world, you know, from outside EU, it's 15% EU workers. That's 700,000 people, um, which again is a, is, a, is a lot of people. And with turnover, uh, say if you say if you took a 10% turnover, 70,000 people a year. One of the key questions that I hope this report will go some way uh, to answering is understanding in terms of not just what the turnover is, but how the turnover works. Are people, um, are people leaving? Uh, companies are they uh, leaving the industry entirely and that will give you a sense of the partnership that industry and government will have to come to uh, as, as part of, a, as part of the, the final settlement for, for achieving their objectives and, and meeting their targets uh, and protecting our interests as well. Um, I mean, another point to say is that the most important point on this slide, by the way, is the last point, which is change is coming and it will be those companies and those businesses uh, that are best prepared for what the new environment is, what the new settlement is, that will be best placed. Because it, 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 will, in, it will require change from all sectors of the economy. It has been a reliable source of supply of skills. Uh, and it, that will change. We're not sure yet to what degree that will change. But you will have to, you know, the, the emphasis, the work that you know, I know the industry is already doing in terms of. Uh, encouraging, changing the perception, getting it to be a career of choice, getting it to be something that young people look to do as somewhere where they can advance really quickly and really rapidly, speaking to parents, speaking to careers, you know, careers advisors and on, getting to see hospitality as an opportunity, rather than something that you might fall into, but getting to see the level of ambition that you have when you have the right candidate. That's something we need to do more of. Um, we're working quite closely with the part called Works and Pension Hospitality Works, which is part of that profile of awareness raising. And also, we are uh, we continue with the big hospitality, hospitality conversation, which I believe has created 67,000 pledges between BHA member businesses and young people themselves in terms of opportunities <coughs> to take their take their first steps in the hospitality industry, which is really encouraging. Now, if you look at those initiatives, that's something I think we we'll need to be seeing more of. We we'll need to scale up as an industry. We we'll need to bring together and do more. Uh, Princip Levy is even more in more of a necessity approach in the right manner for businesses of that size uh, and understanding how the friendship levy affects your business if you're in it. Because uh, as other people here will tell you, it's, it's, a, it's an opportunity to take control of, of the skills budget uh, to a great degree than you've had before. Now considering how skills in the EU will be affected, that's, that's an important, um, important opportunity there. Um, and as a size of the I think the next generation of workers is the biggest of workers in this country is the biggest opportunity if we can get the message through to them. But you should also be thinking about other groups of workers, those looking to return to work, um, people, uh, people with mobility issues, people who um, have recently uh, come out of prison. I mean, honestly, we need to look at every aspect, every every group in society and say, is there a role for us to support them? Now, as I mentioned earlier, Brexit doesn't mean the other issues stop. And it puts, in a sense, more of a, more of a spotlight on them. Because if we're going to be outside the European Union, and depending on what our relationship with the single market is or is not, making sure that the United Kingdom is as competitive as possible for hospitality and tourism is vital. And all of these issues here that you've listed, tourism, VAT, business rates, national living wage, proposals of new tourism bed taxes, a friendship levy, inflation supply chain, online commissions. This is not a criticism of any one of these. Uh, well, tourism VAT, if you ask me, should be reduced immediately. But it is to show you that these are issues that put cost pressures on your businesses. And they all seem to come around at the same time. Um, now, the, when you add that to Brexit, you've got a high degree of political and economic uncertainty that we'll be going into, depending on how quickly the Brexit process will be resolved. At the same time, um, we are, as an industry, because we're a labour-intensive industry in particular, and a people-focused industry, 
a lot of the solutions available to other businesses uh, are not available to us. The classic example would be business <coughs> rates. Uh, I'm sure you've all been following the, the discussion about business rates fairly closely in terms of the, the incredible rises that hotels and restaurants have been seeing in particular. And, uh, and a large part, part of that is the fact that the businesses that are least able to move when business rates get too high is a hotel or a restaurant because a hotel by definition is there and a restaurant by definition is there and, and it's built up its place in the community, it's built up its place in the town. Um, so unlike re retail to Greek can go online or it can move to a, a cheaper uh, shopping area or if you're doing deliveries then you're obviously aware of the great warehouses that Amazon have out out in some remote parts of the UK, but they, they have more room for manoeuvrability. And uh, when it comes to tourism bed taxes, um, I'll, I'll come to this in a second. Uh, when it comes to tourism bed taxes, there's discussions taking place in, in uh, local authorities that we should, we should tax tourism. We should tax tourists who stay overnight, per night, maybe one or two pounds uh, per person. You know, it's, it's all speculation. Um, we, 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 this, we, we, have to, we have to stop this here and now, and it's been an issue that's come back over the years again and again. I think, what, I think one point to, to say here is that, again, austerity is not over. You know, the, the, you've, you heard the Chancellor last week, and he, he announced his budget measures, and the fact is there will be pressures for the foreseeable future in terms of local authority funding. Um, and it, we need to make clear that when it comes to uh, bed tax, it's not a long-term sustainable solution. It's a tax that doesn't just tax hotels uh, and, and uh, the people who stay there. It taxes the, the experience they have across the whole economy. It taxes the choice they make when they go to shop when they're over here. It taxes the choice in terms of the activities they do. It taxes uh, the choice of meal they choose to have. And indeed, in an age where online travel agencies make it easy and ever to compare the prices of different cities and towns. When you're talking about four people staying for a week in a location at one pound per person per head, then that will make a difference when it comes to the ultimate choice because we're a highly sensitive uh, industry in terms of co price. We are, I mean, it, one of the most. So it's, it's vital that we make them see the longer term arguments and benefits about what hospitality and tourism gives you as a growing industry. Uh, it's we must not become the golden goose. We must make sure that we, we recognise the contribution we make without feeling like we have to pay a supplement for our businesses existing. Um, now with Tourism VAT, uh, um, how many of you here have heard about the Cup Tourism VAT campaign? Okay, I need to do a better job then. Okay, Tourism VAT. This is an important one. This is, the, this is, this is really important because every other country in Europe um, has a... Uh, has, well, not every other country, I think Denmark and Slovakia, the exception, have a reduced rate of VAT on tourism. That's because it's a labour-intensive, again, industry. It's an export industry, so you don't really want to put VAT on, a, on an export. I mean, we're the, only, we're the only industry that is an export that has VAT on it. And if you look at that chart there, that's fairly indicative about where the UK stands to the others. If you look at the major other European destinations, France, Italy, Spain, 10%. Ireland 9%, Germany 7% and it, and it can get lower. Now this has been a direction of travel within Europe. So again, when you're coming back to Brexit and you're looking about how we're going to be competitive outside of the European Union, understanding how tourism VAT impacts is absolutely critical because every year, year on year, a hotel in, in France, Spain or Italy will have more to invest in its staff, more to invest in its renovations, if it wants to be more price competitive, it could as well, or it could invest in its marketing. And every year, that gap gets wider between businesses of a certain size here and businesses of a certain size there. Uh, and that's an argument that every other country has recognised in Europe, except Denmark and Slovakia. And I see no reason why it cannot be accepted here. The positive news is, as it says 170 here, as of yesterday, it's 171 MPs signed up in favour of the principle of reduction on tourism VAT. We want to get to 200 this year. If any of you are in touch with your MP or would like to meet your MP, I'd be very happy to give you the fact sheet. It's a nice, simple fact sheet which can go into your hands and you can leave it with them because it's a really good economic case. I and mean, in fact, you might think, oh, this sounds, sounds a bit too, you know, this, this doesn't sound like it's got all party support. It does. It, it's got more Conservative MPs. We've got a list of the 171. It's really spread. It's a cross party issue that, that does attract support. And, it, and it, the campaign is, is 
really, really being well picked up by MPs as well because they see the point and there's been select, there's been select committee inquiries finding this back. The important point to make is it doesn't cost the country money and that's why other countries have done it. it you'll find after 10 years as it says here, it wouldn't only include ex improve exports by 20 billion but the Treasury would gain almost five billion pounds in extra tax receipts due to the extra business as well. Um, and that's aside from giving power to local businesses. Instead of looking um, channel money uh, back to the treasury, you'd be having hotels who are major investors in their communities choosing as to how they can best promote their businesses. Um, I think online and digital, I'll give you a quick mention and then I'll start to wrap up. So please have those questions ready. Uh, online and digital, I think we're a modern industry, we're very innovative. Uh, if you look at the way um, our, our natural hospitality industry is performed, that, 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 that is shown. And we have embraced uh, the online revolution, you know, the emergence of the internet. We, we must not afford to be seen as anti-internet, because we're not. You can, you know, the, the businesses we have can, uh, can market themselves to New Zealand or Antarctica just for a simple platform that, so that wasn't available 40 or 50 years ago. But it does present challenges which um, we need to work with government in terms of addressing. I mean, one is ensuring that uh, dominant positions do not emerge which, uh, which, uh, which make it unfair marketplace, especially in terms of online travel agents, which we now have such a huge role in directing traffic and, and directing uh, and how, how businesses are listed and presented, um, and ensuring that there's a fair level of permission and that uh, in the case of rate parity agreements where it's about making sure we, we want to make sure that businesses have the freedom to present the prices of their choice where they want to. And in Germany and France, you've seen some progression uh, at a judicial level in Germany and at a legislative level in France in terms of making sure that uh, there is not an anti-competitive circumstance. And I think do, ensuring the same here is just as important when you consider where we may be with OTAs and uh, the, the dominance of certain companies in, uh, in a few, uh, now or in a few years. And the other point is the sharing economy. For everything I've said, you have, will have heard about Airbnb. Some of you may have stayed in Airbnb. Um, we focus on Airbnb on two levels. One is taxation uh, and the sharing economy. And one is um, regulation and the sharing economy. And when it comes to um, the protection of guests or food safety or fire safety, it's important that the same rules are, uh, happen across all accommodation providers. Uh, not least uh, for, again, for the reputation of the UK as a, as a safe and welcoming place to visit. So there's discussions taking place there. I, I, I think there's a lot more interest in the discussions I've had with politicians around the sharing economy because it's grown so, so quickly in such a short time and I look forward to continuing those discussions. I think the interesting point to refer to there, and I won't go into too much detail there, is to look at what other countries are doing um, in terms of Paris, Barcelona, New York, uh, and West Coast America in terms of different approaches that can be taken to manage the sharing economy in the, in the most appropriate manner. Um, there isn't uh, currently a, a standard solution that's been developed by local authorities, but it's, a, it's an important issue nonetheless, and one that does present big questions because they, they have a very different model, so making sure it's a, fair, it's, a, it's a fair marketplace there as well, not just within Europe, but domestically as well is very important. Now, I think I've closely marked my half an hour there. And I'll, I'll bring you back to Brexit. I'll remind you that Article 50 still isn't activated, that there are big questions about workforce. I want to hear your big questions. Uh, I really do. So on that, I will say thank you oh, and hand over to the, to the audience. <laughs> I think, I think focusing on the now is really important. And I, I, I think there's three points there I'd like to say. I think focusing on the now is really important because we can get preoccupied about what the next, you know, next 24 months and what's happening. I mean, what is happening now is as challenging as the challenges we can see lined up because there was already in many parts of the hospitality industry a shortage of skills. 
Uh, and there was already initiatives underway to help get more people into it. Now, a lot more has to be done. I'm pleased about what the industry is doing and I'd like to see, see more of it. I'd like the BHA to, be, to do more as well and I think that's, that's what we'll plan to do in, in the run-up. I, I think one thing to, we should mention is that, and it's, a, it's an obvious point, is there isn't one UK hospitality economy. There's many different variations. You've got London, you know, you, and we're at the highest level of uh, employment for some time now in London, the South East, and it's different in other parts of the country as well. You've got, got different issue. But in other parts of the country, you'll find that rural, you know, people do want the jobs, but then the rural transport is, is more an issue. And making the last mile there's quite challenging. So there isn't, when it comes to the, the, the shortage, there isn't a solution that would work for London as much as, say, work for some parts of the Lake District. But plugging, <laughs> making the connection is absolutely, uh, absolutely critical. I think national living wage is, you know, uh, is, uh, is welcome. I mean, the thing, the thing about the national living wage is it does present serious challenges for businesses because of the other issues I've presented to you. If you look at the industries that are going to be uh, having the greatest impact from, from the national living wage, it'll be hospitality, social care, and uh, one other which uh, temporarily escapes me, but hospitality and social care are the top two. And for social care, what the government's done is, uh, is looking at increasing council rates to pay. Uh, but that's not an option that's available to us. At the same time, we want, to, we want to pay as much as possible, get the best people in the jobs to get the best result. That's fairly straightforward. Um, and when you look at tourism VAT, if you, if you had the same staffing arrangements in France and you've got, ten, you've got a 100% difference in terms of the VAT being paid, which otherwise I'm not sure where you'd put it, but it sounds like you might put it in some of their placements you'd be trying to recruit um, and, and try to increase it that way. So yeah, I think we mustn't, I mean, I would say we mustn't forget about the now. I think it's, I've also, anecdotally, and I add anecdotally, you know, I have heard that there are EU workers that in, in, since the referendum have gone back to the continent and stayed there. Um, there seems to be quite a few nods around. Now I haven't got hard data on that, but that would be concerning if that became a pattern that developed. And when you look at currency depreciation, you can understand why. I'm not saying it's necessarily an international reputation. It could be just a cold-headed economic decision in their best interest. But that's now, you know, that's an impact of the referendum, not of Article 50. So thank you, Lisa. Anyone else has a question? Some people would refer you to the laws of the market uh, and uh, how it's commonly understood. And the conversations I've actually had with the members, I think, again, it does depend a lot by region and by the type of shortages they're facing, which also seems to change enough that, that it's a different challenge in certain areas. Um, it's not just, they're not just looking at wages, though. I mean, wages is an obvious route, but when you're talking about a lack of actual numbers of pe people, you also have to look at increasing the number as much as increasing, uh, increasing the recompense, the, the rewards and the incentives to work there. So there, as much as the immediate term is looking at uh, what the wages is, that if you're, if you're a leading establishment, say in Leeds or in Newcastle, you need to be looking at your relationship with the colleges and the schools that will be feeding through the next generation as well. So I think it's, it's partly that, but I think they're looking beyond as well. And it's, it's, it's a strange time uh, because we're still pre-Article 50. So I don't think that... I don't think the realisation that the Brexit, well, it hasn't begun yet, the Brexit negotiation period hasn't begun yet. It might, then this is a personal view, it might become more real. Uh, you know, the Brexit might become more real once you hear it being discussed day in and day out, and then you might see more impacts in terms of people considering their workforce supply. But that's my, my spe speculation. Thank you. There are a lot of colleges. I don't, I don't mean it. <laughs> <laughs> there are a lot of colleges that are actually cancelling the hospitality courses. It's all mm. linked to funding. Mm. And that's such a pity. Is, is this, uh, I mean, I, it's not, not something I mean, I'm aware of in detail. Is this something that uh, uniform across the country that you're seeing in particular courses? It particular, is. Yeah. In certain areas, you get more reductions. And, and even with apprenticeships as well, you are getting a lot of apprenticeships. Mm. But now it just seems to be. Mm. Is there a standard justification? Is it a, a lack of demand <laughs> from the students? Is uh, it a quote? 
mm. all linked with the funding. Mm. Well, I, I, I might raise it on with John later. Thank you. don't understand is in colleges and on the courses they don't actually study accommodation anymore mm. it's gone yes. which is what our side of the industry is so important um, and when I know a long time ago I did accommodation and that's where I came through straight wanting to do it mm -hmm. but it's not studied and it's not even studied I don't think very much at degree level either mm. so even at the basics right up it doesn't it's not studied mm -hmm. Thank you. But if they haven't got the specialists, it's no use bringing some no. Uncle Tom yeah. Cobley and all yeah. in to teach yeah. it when they don't know what yeah. the hell they're teaching. Mm. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. absolutely. Mm. So and especially when you basic. showed a slide when you were saying it's like the 12 and 13 years old, how are we going to attract them to come and work in the hotels? And how are we going to attract them to come and work as a room attendants to clean the rooms? Mm -hmm. yeah. <laughs> oh, that's not good. <laughs> <laughs> I can give you an example. I'm always looking for fresh talent f for the hotel I work in, obviously. Um, and even down when I'm down to shopping, if I see someone with that smiley face, I'm asking them the question to, you know, how long have you worked here? Are you looking for any work? And I came across a lovely young lady. She worked in Iceland. And she said that she was working in Iceland for £8.40 an hour. Um, and she was working 20 hours a week. Um, and she was looking for a part-time job. And I said, great, I can help you. We've got vacancies. Um, what would you like to do? She said, oh, what, what do you do? I explained a little bit about hospitality. What do you pay? No, thank you. And her exact words were, oh, it sounds too much hard work. And I said, no, no, it's great. You get your lunch, did the selling bit, and gave her my card. I'm not going to hear mm. from that girl. And I thought, what a shame, because she sat at a checkout. She had a lot of potential. She just wouldn't come. And I just, I just think, well, where do you go with it? You know, mm. you keep trying um, to encourage people. So mm. I just wondered out there who's, who's going to keep fighting for hospitality um, I think if the, it, we've got to move a lot quicker than what's happening, waiting two years, because what we've seen already now, people are leaving mm. uh, or from all over the place. And if you're getting the same money back in your own country and cheaper housing, you're going to go and do that. We've already seen a mass exit. I'm actually from the north. People going up north, you can get a flat for 500 quid a month against a room for 804 people living in it. Mm. Uh, to do the jobs and all my girls at the minute they all share rooms and we, we, we give a lot of incentives to the team but we're, we're limited to of what we can give thank you mm. I, I haven't got too much to answer in each question except to say that you know I have a good relationship with the UK Housekeeping Association and I think there's some very particular issues here that, you know for your members um, I, I guess two points one is I think a case can always be made for a career in the hospitality industry. Uh, I really do believe that. Um, now, it might be it's, it's going to be challenging in particular subsectors because, because of the nature of the role. But if you consider what it offers, if you, if you, decided, to do, you, know, if you decided to go down a different route, if you can, I believe if you condensed a good hospitality career from the very entry level all the way through to all the experience you'd had, and you condensed it into 60 seconds, and you, you got it through to a young person, it would be of enough interest to see how far you can go. We've got great stories in our industry about people that came in at entry level and made it all the way to the top. You know, that's like that offers. And even if you don't make it to the top, you pick up skills which you can use in so many different places. I don't have the exact number. I'm, I'm thinking in the 30s. Um, so there's, it's, it's, it's particular. I would say the, there's particular pickup in Northern Ireland and Scotland, because of the way their hospitality economy is structured. And they look at Ireland as well, which is just across the border for Ireland, just a short hop. And that's the same sort of tourism market they're looking at. So they feel like Ireland's got a real advantage at nine percent VAT. It is a real job to ensure that all of those interests are represented. I would say yes. Um, 
I would say, not just in the day-to-day -day operations. I mean, we've, uh, I think most recently we had a parliamentary inquiry for the all-party group for the visitor economy where we had MPs as well as ourselves to look at all of the different types of roles. To, you know, that hospitality isn't necessarily front desk reception at a hotel. You know, it's beyond, beyond that. And it's an important point because so many people have, you know, they see the hotel lobby and sometimes if they're having a good holiday, that's, that's as far as they see because really great service is sometimes hard to spot because it's so good. You know, it's, it's, it's easy to notice. We all know it, you know, we go to the shop or someone's in front of you at an ATM taking a bit too much time. It's always not easy to notice when it's not going so well. But um, I would say yes. And, and, and that report looked at all the different levels. I think, un at the same time, these relationships, the one I'm having today with you all is, is critical in understanding the particular, uh, the particular challenges. I mean, someone here, here mentioned a particular one about getting young people to look at uh, how, how you get them interested in, you know, tidying rooms, basically. I will have to decline to answer that because <laughs> Even if it's a personal view, it won't be reported as one. Um, but um, no, if you would like an informal chat about Scotland outside, have a couple of tea. Right. I, 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 my answer would be that both Brexit and, and the, the question of devolution, not just to Scotland and Northern Ireland, uh, and you know, they've been issues before Brexit as well. Um, and they will always have to be managed as issues because there's a diversity of opinion. Bernard, thank you very, very much. Thank you.